Welcome. Uh, during this session, we'll gain perspective on bushfires and climate from the former Chief Fire Officer of Tasmania Fire Service, Mike Brown, who has nearly 40 years experience in the fire service. He'll touch on his experience fighting fires, the role of climate and bushfires, and how we can better prepare for fighting catastrophic bushfires going forward. So without further ado, I'll jump straight into the questions that we have prepared for Mike. Uh, so let's start by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and your experience fighting fires. I um, started work with the Rural Fires Board, it was known as back then, uh, back in 1977, uh, having left um, Year 12 and being a bit disillusioned what I was going to do in the future. It, it wasn't about my um, uh, parents buying me fire trucks to play with, it was just, uh, it seemed like a good career option at the time. So I started a cadetship in 77. And then in 79, we had legislation change in Tasmania where the fire services were amalgamated. So in a lot of jurisdictions, you have a, a rural fire service and an urban fire service in Tasmania that were amalgamated in uh, uh, 79. And that took quite some time to happen. Um, I worked initially in field operations, which included bushfire management and the development management of volunteer firefighters. And uh, I was there for quite some time on the east coast of Tasmania, which was perhaps more one of the more fire prone areas in Tasmania. Uh, and then I developed uh, an interest in training. So I moved to the training division and worked as an instructor for several years, both um, in the south of the state and also just outside of, of Launceston at the training, the fire service training school there. Um, and then I moved into um, a combined role, so managing a career brigade at, at Devonport on the northwest coast, so uh, a small city, but also uh, with that managing a rural district as well, which included about 30 or 40 volunteer brigades over an area of about six municipalities. Uh, and I was involved in, certainly in bushfire management um, then, but we took a statewide approach to... Um, a lot of our work in fire operations so it wasn't unusual to work uh, back down on the east coast or over in the west coast as uh, we had fires developed. Well, well I guess most people think Tasmania is a, a cool wet place. Um, it is fire prone, um, much of southeastern Australia is and it's as fire prone as anywhere else in the world and Tasmania has had a history of significant bushfires um, over the years. Um, after a while and perhaps in the early 2000s, I became more involved in management and I led, I led the uh, Northern Region as the regional, uh, regional officer, the position was called then, so sort of looking after um, the management of the Launceston Fire Brigade and the career staff involved with that and the field staff and volunteers associated with uh, the uh, Northern part of the state. Uh, and in about 2000 and Five, I was promoted to Deputy Chief Officer, uh, moving back down to Hobart, and then about 2009 uh, to Chief Officer. So I was in the Chief Officer's role with Tasmania Fire Service, um, which included the roles of Chief Executive Officer, uh, Head of Operations and Chair of the State Fire Commission uh, up until uh, 2016. So the, the, the role with firefighting was... Um, uh, varied as the service was amalgamated, included urban operations as well. Um, but I think legislation and better building standards and better education uh, kind of lessened the number of things like we were getting like on house size. Uh, but we saw things developing and getting worse in respect to uh, to bushfires. Well, that does lead on to my next question for you, which is, what did you see in the latest bushfire season? And how does that relate to the last decade of your experience? Yeah, so uh, the latest bushfire season, I, I guess for anyone else like myself and um, being uh, an experienced and retired uh, fire officer was probably one of a bit of frustration saying, why can't we get out there back on the front foot as well? Um, but... Uh, we did see things developed in a fairly horrendous kind of a way. So uh, we saw um, about this time last year, we just started to notice that the landscape was uh, was very dry. Uh, we'd seen and was seen develop major fires in um, places throughout Europe and certainly the United States and was starting to develop some concerns for what was likely to happen uh, 
in our own local context here in Australia. And um, the news the news has been there. I mean, what what was happen um, from very early in spring right through to uh, to about February is um, absolutely outstanding in terms of the areas burned. So almost 13 million hectares uh, burnt in the Australian context is just something we're just not used to. We're most certainly used to seeing bushfires every year. Uh, and we're also used to seeing major fires occur from time to time over history. But what we saw in, in virtually every jurisdiction this year um, and almost at the same time were extremely significant fires developing and of a size and scope that were very clearly uh, uncontrollable and uh, the resultant losses that have occurred around that um, will be remembered and, and, and most certainly will be the subject of uh, the various investigations and the Royal Commission which is just starting off for present. Um, are you able to tell us about the Emergency Leaders for Climate Action Group and why it was formed? Yes, yeah, so sure. The um, uh, Chief Officers and Senior Officers from the Fire and Emergency Services and Land Management Agencies too, from across the country, had been united for a considerable time now, about 20 years we've had, over the past 20 years, we've had an organisation that's uh, seen us meet together um, and form relationships and work together on on uh, reviewing um, problems as they occur and how we're going to meet the challenges um, in the fire and emergency services context. And that organisation is the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council, uh, otherwise known as AFAC. And we form good relationships through that. And uh, from time to time, even in retirement, we've kept in touch with uh, our colleagues across that network. And it was um, about April last year that uh, Greg, Mullins, who's retired commissioner for Fire and Rescue New South Wales, called me uh, for a catch up, and a bit of a the discussion got to um, climate climate change. And Greg told me how he joined the the Climate Council as a councillor and asked me about what was my opinion and observations about climate change, which I guess because I'd been retired, I'd had a bit more opportunity to reflect back on. Uh, what I'd seen over the past decade or so uh, while whilst in the job of course we knew about climate change and we knew that things uh, were happening as a result of increasing emissions across the globe and we knew it was having an impact on the fire frequency and fire intensity um, but I guess we did, weren't able to do a great deal about it because uh, we were busy in our own careers in, in managing the fires if you like that um, kept popping up and also there's some constraint in that we're employed by uh, political leadership and from time to time there's political political leadership uh, views and policies that don't necessarily align to fire chiefs being able to go out and speak about what they've seen and observed and what they and uh, what they think and their observations of the science that started come forward so yeah in retirement chance to think about how I'd seen things developed over my 39 years in my career and um, uh, it did cause me to, to suggest that things are getting exponentially worse uh, and then Greg talked about um, the, his idea of uh, getting the band to get back together and um, having a group of senior leadership from the fire, land management, and emergency services context uh, or, or scenario to um, start making a voice and start making a stand about climate action. Wonderful. So there has been a lot of misinformation around hazard reduction, and a lot of it has specifically pointed the finger at local governments not properly managing hazard reduction. Can you tell us a bit about this, whose role it actually is, and is it the silver bullet that we're all being led to believe? Yeah, okay. Well, I've got to start off by saying I'm a firm uh, advocate for hazard reduction as a way of reducing fuels, and if we reduce fuels, uh, we can reduce intensity of fires. In fact, uh, it's, one of, it's one of the only things we can really um, effectively control. So uh, I know after we've had uh, major fires in the past, in particular the um, Black Saturday fires in Victoria, um, I, I pushed for a more proactive stance and response to getting fuel um, 
done uh, in, in Tasmania in, in, uh, in our own context. And um, that had been to some degree successful. But I've got to understand that while the fuel management over the back fence is important, so we do ask that councils and land management agencies such as parks agencies and forestry agencies do take a responsible approach to managing fuels and providing buffer zones between build up areas and communities uh, and their areas in which they manage. It is not necessarily the silver bullet. And in fact, I would be uh, so strong as to say that the fuel that is most important to people's survivability, uh, and that's of their homes, their assets, and their own lives, is most likely to be the fuel that's between their back doorstep and their back fence. So while that fuel out there is important to manage, um, it's not necessarily the silver bullet. And we've got to look at um, what the fuel is out there and fuel can be reduced where we've got uh, dry forest types, dry sclerophyll forest. It can't be reduced uh, in alpine forest, for example. It can't be reduced in wet uh, forest. It can't be reduced in, um, uh, in rainforest. And most certainly it's difficult to manage where we've got pasture and improved agricultural land. So when we look at the whole context of what's out there and what can burn, that that can be managed through fuel reduction to some degree is only a relatively small percentage of the landscape anyway. So we've got to put that into context. Um, the, the other thing that's got to be remembered is that uh, fires or bushfires are going to be tenure blind. So whether it be land that's parks land, forestry land, parks land or private property, uh, the fire is not going to discriminate between one or the other. So where there are fuel reduction uh, programs, it can't just be about burning a per certain percentage of the forest on public lands. It's got to include all lands if we're going to be effective in having fuel reduction strategies into the future. So in short, it's got a big part to play, but it's far from uh, the silver bullet answer. Thank you. As you mentioned, the science is telling us that we need to be better prepared for worsening bushfire seasons. What do we need to do as a country to better prepare? And how can local councils better prepare their communities? I, I think if we're going to look at the, the main thing, the main thing is going to be changing uh, in a more positive way what we're seeing happen with climate change. So we know that we're producing more and more emissions every year and that, that, that emissions production has got a direct correlation with the climate. And the sorts of things that we're seeing happen to the climate have got an adverse impact on the landscape. Uh, certainly in a fire sense, we're seeing uh, broad areas um, dry out much quicker. We're seeing fire extinguishers, uh, fire seasons being much uh, more extended than they've been in the past. And we're seeing fire intensity um, really increasing. So but we know uh, it was only in uh, 2009 when we had the Black Saturday fires. We had to, if you like, invent another fire danger rating on top of extreme. And we hear that word catastrophic, sometimes used in the context it shouldn't be used in, um, but we hear that word of catastrophic fire danger these days. And we're seeing catastrophic fire danger uh, occur from time to time. And with that, we're getting things like the pure pyrocumulus uh, cloud effects, where we're getting fires actually create uh, their own fire weather conditions. So we've, um, the main thing would be to do whatever we can to reduce emissions and do that rapidly and turn, turn the whole economy around to a greater reliance on renewables uh, in the future. And if we don't do that, we're going to see this escalation of uh, climate issues just become worse and worse and worse. And it's, and it's in the broader context of emergency management too. So if we look at average rainfall maps, for example, we do know that we've got some areas that uh, are most certainly still on average rainfall and others that have probably even got an increase in rainfall. But how we're seeing that rainfall come uh, in more recent times is, is that it's coming with big events. So we're getting major and uh, very destructive flooding events uh, happen. And we know uh, that the weather uh, events that cause that are most certainly influenced by climate change. So um, the whole issue of uh, climate and its impact on um, emergency events and what's happening across the landscape is not just in a bushfire context. That's probably the one that's been more recent. It's more frequent, um, but we're also seeing it in terms of other um, major and weather events as well. 
Um, so far as uh, local government councils go, uh, they do, do have a role in emergency management and a very important role in emergency management. So in managing uh, their land and, and their people, um, parks, uh, councils often have parks and reserves. And if there can be um, uh, a mind around the bushfire risk that's associated with that from time to time, so where uh, it's in the right fuel type, uh, can be subject to um, fuel reduction burning, and that does happen from time to time. And where it's not in the fuel type that's um, uh, that's amenable to fuel reduction burning, there's got to be some um, uh, effort and work placed on preparing buffer zones, buffer zones between the vegetation and and back to um, the private property. And in regard to private property management, I said there before that really for people's survivability of themselves and of their properties and their assets is that fuel that's um, the closest to their asset that's important. So it's often from the, from the back door to the back fence that's important to manage. And councils have um, a role, I know in my state, and I assume it's with other states as well, uh, with um, uh, hazard abatement. So councils um, inspect from time to time or take complaints from people in the community about uh, fuels and accumulating on uh, vacant blocks of land or even in people's backyard an action can be taken by council on issuing abatement notices to have that fuel uh, reduced and um, putting uh, people and the community in a better situation ahead of uh, fire seasons. Um, with that in, in recognising what's a fire hazard and what is it and I understand that can be um, uh, somewhat a specialist skill and councils may not have the resources or people that are qualified or experienced in recognising what's necessarily a bushfire hazard and what isn't. And I do ask that councils knock on the door of TAS Fire Service to get some assistance with that because um, TAS Fire Service have over time provided training for municipal staff in how to um, help them in identifying fire hazards and how to help them in identifying uh, what kind of um, mitigation activities might be appropriate to to given given types of hazards so that's a pretty important role for councils and i do ask that councils do all they can to engage with their emergency services too so um, a lot of the council's communities are emergency members too an example being if tasmania's got a population of about half a million we know that tas fire service volunteers total about five thousand so there's one in one hundred uh, Tasmanians have a direct association or membership with TAS Fire Service. So uh, keep that in mind and keep um, the good work up in engaging with your emergency services too. So both TAS Fire and the State Emergency Service because councils can often be very influential in um, helping develop um, educational programs and bushfire risk mitigation programs together with the fire service. So there's a big role for councils to play. Um, uh, and uh, the, another important one is also in preparing communities for emergencies by way of helping out in identifying and facilitating community evacuation places. Now they might be um, facilitated evacuation centres or they could be places of last resort. Um, and there's an important difference between the two, but um, we rely on those as a, as a place that people can go to uh, as and when uh, the bushfire or indeed flood situations develop in the community. And, um, councillors are very well equipped um, and experienced in being able to provide those sorts of facilities. That's wonderful. Thank you. Such great advice. Uh, well, that's nearly the end of our questions. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, Mike, that we haven't covered that you think it's important for our councils to know? Uh, I don't think there's anything um, in particular, but a little bit from my own experience. I can, uh, when we've had major events happen um, out there in the state, uh, particularly in the latter part of my career, I saw this as being important, is that we, we engaged local government leadership uh, in getting them to have an understanding of what we did and why we did it. So, for example, after the 2013 fires uh, in Tasmania, they burned across some pretty big areas. And I'm sure that um, 
uh, I personally made an offer to the mayors and general managers from I think about six different councils to get up in, uh, in a helicopter with an incident controller to get an idea of what we had done, uh, assess the damage and get an idea from the incident controller as to what we did and why we did it. So where did we do back burns from or where did we evacuate people out of and what was happening on the day to get a firm understanding of that because at the end of the day the, the fire service or the state emergency services packs up its bags and uh, goes home when the um, when the bushfire is out or the, or the floods receded but it's local government that's got to live with the people and respond to the people uh, in terms of recovering and also in terms of managing any uh, questions or even criticism about what was done so if we've got senior local government leadership understanding the strategy behind what happened while the emergency was on, I think that improves the situation for, for, for everyone. And I, I know from my own experience, that's paid dividends in a number of times because after the incident, six months later, uh, someone else comes up and idea, of an idea of why wasn't this done at the time? Um, and if we've had that good engagement post the incident uh, with local government, local governments there to be able to respond to it. And to um, and to understand why thing why certain things was done, or why certain things had happened.